Welcome to our service for today, the third Sunday after in Advent. And we meet in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I'm now going to light the third Advent candle, the Baptist. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light those things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the for the third Sunday of Advent. O Lord Jesus Christ, who at thy first coming did send thy messenger to prepare the way before you, Grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that by the second coming to judge the world we may be found an acceptable people in your sight, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Paul is now going to read the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61. The servant of the Lord said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise 
instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord God, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with the garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, when, now, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you, you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the throng of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to start this homily with some questions, but be warned, they're deeply personal and direct questions. How has your life been? I mean really been. Has it been one long and continuous pattern of achievement, success, pleasure and harmony? Or have there been times when you have felt all at sea in the proverbial wilderness, confused and misunderstood? My hunch is that most of us have all spent time in the wilderness. I know that I have. 
And the thing about being in the wilderness, and Advent and Lent are invitations to enter into a spiritual wilderness, is that it can perversely end up being a season of real and sustained growth. Because in the wilderness, we are asked to undertake the hard work of looking at ourselves honestly, owning up to the pain as well as our anxieties for ourselves. In some ways, given all that is going on in the world, Advent seems just that little bit sharper this year. Please do use Advent to reflect, seriously reflect, on the past, your past, and the future. However, if we are to do Advent justice, what we mustn't do is get stuck and allow ourselves to be enslaved by the past or held hostage by the future. We must instead learn, what we must learn to do instead is to shorten our horizons and look to the present, asking ourselves what we can do specifically in the here and now to make things better, to make ourselves better. For Advent is a time for spiritual and communal healing. John the Baptist, the wild man of the Gospels and the last of the prophets, helpfully provides some answers. My first suggestion, or the first suggestion that he makes, is that we should avoid at all costs developing our very own Messiah complex. I am not the Messiah, this popular John explains. Now, it might come as a surprise, but neither am I, and neither are you. The salvation of the world, or even the church, is not down to you or me. It's God's business, plain and simple. Phew, you might think. But let's be clear, in many of us, individually and corporately, there is to be found a Messiah complex. But it's a complex we mustn't feed, for salvation comes not through our works, but through God's grace. But, and it's a big but, this doesn't mean that we should remain entirely passive, just waiting for God to do some God-like things, for that would be because stubbornness and not Christians. God does ask us to do stuff and work with him and for him. We are God's partners in mission and evangelism, so what should we do? Well, what we should do is follow John's second suggestion, the one we heard in last week's Gospel reading. We should repent. Repent is one of the scariest words in the Gospel, but ultimately it's the source of all true liberation, salvation even. Quite simply, to repent means to turn around and look in the other direction. Repent means to stop looking into the past, mistakes of the past can be repeated, and stop projecting into the future because our projections are always wrong. To repent means to, to decide to look reality in the face and act on it. To repent in the Christian use of the word means to focus on the person of Jesus Christ, the face of Jesus Christ, even the infant face of Jesus Christ, our ultimate reality and to act as he would have us act, so that we, like John, become not only the voice, but the living embodiment of ones crying out in the wilderness. And there is no better time to do this than in a crisis, a COVID crisis. The alternative to repentance, let's be clear, is passivity, retrenchment, and digging in in the vain hope that all things will return to normal how we want them to be which might, of course, be a very different thing to how God wants them to be. Repentance, it turns out, is a continually active choice. The opposite of repentance, the hardest word, is, of course, the ugliest word, sin. So what, we, what do we do when we need to truly repent so that we, in solidarity of John the Baptist, can make straight the way of the Lord. The good news is that we don't have to come up with clever and novel solutions, for as I already stressed, we are not the Messiah. 
And the one sure route to failure is to feed our inner Messiah complexes. The prophet Isaiah instead provides us with the answers. Rooted from prayer and worship, what we need to do is play our part in binding the brokenhearted, comforting those who mourn, feeding the hungry, releasing those captives to their own wildest fears and fantasies, pursuing justice, and when asked, giving a true and heartfelt account of our faith in Jesus, the Messiah. As we enter deeper into Advent, please do embrace your inner wilderness with honesty and then repent. Relinquish all thoughts that you or even we are the answer to the problem of salvation, both in the here and now and on into eternity, so that paradoxically we become the sort of people who, like the John, John the Baptist, gets out of the way in order to make way for the one who is coming, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Paul is now going to lead us in prayer. As the grace of God has opened a way for us so that we may come before him. Let us pray in the assurance that he is present among us today. Father of all, in this season of Advent, as we await in joy and expectation for the birth of our Saviour Jesus Christ, this for us is the good news of which Isaiah speaks. For he brings us forgiveness, and the hope of justice, of peace, and of eternal life. Lord, you have in your generosity granted us such powers for good or evil. We have been gifted the chance to do good in the world, but we often abuse or neglect the bounty and the possibilities you have given us. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, Forgive our foolish ways. Reclose us in our rightful mind. In pure lives thy service find. In deeper reverence pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you know that this year of 2020, of COVID, of restrictions, of lockdowns, has been so hard for us. But the use of the powers for good you have given us in the rapid identification and production of effective vaccines enables us to look forward beyond this bleak winter to better things to come in 2021 and beyond. You have granted us the precious gift of hope. Father, we give you thanks for the work of scientists, clinicians, technicians and others who have made this rapid development to roll out possible. And we thank you for the dedication of the NHS staff who, has, who have sustained us throughout and continue to do so. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. But how have you used the new hope, the new opportunities we now have? We must not just seek to revert to things as they were before COVID, since they, these things were so clearly, deeply flawed 
in a multitude of ways. No, inspired by the birth of your son and the promise of new life that his coming showed us, we must resolve to make what comes now better. Help us all, inspired by you, to start the process of rebuilding. We thank you, Lord, for the good work which has already been done locally, for the food cupboard, for the shop, for the quiet acts of neighbourliness by so many. We thank you for the enormous amount of hard work which goes into just keeping our church running when so many churches are not. Bless and strengthen all those involved. Help us, inspired by you, to build on the growth of charity and compassion we see all around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our environment. We have made such a mess of our world up to now. We pray for the strength and resolve to make this new world we will create greener, cleaner, better. We pray for all who are helping to make our future more sustainable, more healthy, kinder, more as you would have it be, in small ways as well as large. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders in government, both national and local, in our church, in our diocese, in our parish. Guide them in their deliberations and help them to take the difficult decisions they have to make sensitively and courageously. We pray for a solution to the seemingly intractable problems besetting the negotiations with the European Union over trade. May a way forward be found that is to the benefit of all your peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those who are troubled or in distress, in body, mind or spirit. In particular, we pray for those who have specifically asked that we do pray for them. Sorry. Mary Claire, Roy, Tim, Storm, Carolyn, Nigel and Lisa, Heather, Anne and Alan, Penny, all those at Swan House, Harry, Isabel, Joshua, Grace and family, Becky, Alison, Noel, Pippa, Rosemary, Canon Ian Draffin, and Paige. Lord, give your children healing and peace, and in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we pray for those who have now gone beyond the conflicts of this world. Grant rest to those who have seen your promises fulfilled. From our memorial book, we think in particular of Terence Yearly, Joyce Oliver, Douglas Self, and George Walton. Drop thy still dews of quietness, till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who shine in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word. Through him you have created all things who are sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about amongst us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the, revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks because you sent him to redeem us from sin and death and to make us inheritors of everlasting life that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may with joy behold his appearing and in confidence may stand before him. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which was shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. And so, Father, calling to mind his death upon the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send your Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of St. Lawrence, St. James, the Blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints may praise and glorify you forever and ever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes in glory.
the body of Christ, broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. We give you thanks, O Lord, for these heavenly gifts. Kindle in us the fire of your Spirit, that when your Christ comes again, we may shine as lights before his face, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Christ, the Son of righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. This is a message for all of the children in the Diocese of Oxford, in our churches and in our schools. There's more than 60,000 of you, that's a lot, and everyone is very, very special. I want to ask for your help. Thank you for all the good things you've done and said in this very hard year, for every smile and kind word and good deed. Thank you for all of your prayers. God has heard every single one. This is going to be a very different Christmas. There are some things we just can't do because of the coronavirus. We can't see all of our family and friends. We can't get together for big parties. We can't sing carols inside our church buildings. But there's a lot we still can do to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We can sing outside. Many of us can gather in our churches safely. We can read the Christmas story in our homes, around the fire, 
or in your favourite cosy place. We can be together online with our church family and with our friends. We can love and care for others in practical ways and we can spread comfort and joy. The Christmas story is so beautiful because sadness and joy go together and the joy is brighter than the sadness. It was hard for Mary and Joseph to make the journey to Bethlehem and stay in a stable. It was hard for Mary to give birth to the baby Jesus. But there's such joy in the story as well, in the songs of the angels, in the gifts of the wise men, in the excitement of the shepherds, and most of all, in the birth of baby Jesus, who comes to save us from the darkness, because Jesus is the light for the whole world. Lots of people are very sad this Christmas time. But even when we're sad, it's important to remember good times and those we love. It's good to laugh and smile and look forward to better times ahead. I've got a serious problem. I've run out of jokes this Christmas, and so I need your help. I want you to send me, if you can, your funniest side-splitting joke, which makes people smile. You can send it to me in an email or on a video, and I'll send them out to all of the vicars and the head teachers all across the diocese so they can pass them on to other people and help people smile and remember the joy and the good times in this Christmas season. I hope we can use some of them in our Christmas services. If there are lots, I'll make them into a book and try and send a copy to your church and school. Have a really happy and wonderful Christmas. Even if we're sad, we can still be happy as well and smile. God bless you and God bless your family this Christmas time. Smile though your heart is aching. Smile even 